Welcome to Go Lurk Yourself, a podcast about playing video games and streaming on the internet. My name is Crunky. And I'm Real Amanda. Hey, Real Amanda, how you been? I am doing very, very well. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just great. Enjoying my lovely time in the holidays as usual. And how are you doing in the apocalypse? Uh, Oh, you mean lockdown? (laughs) Yes. Uh, Well, I live in America. I don't know what you're talking about, this lockdown thing. We just don't (laughs) even give a shit. We're just like, hey, you want to go to the store? You want to go out and drink and have a good time and and go to the restaurant and... Like each other's uh, eyeballs? <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's spin our hands and shake on this. Like, you know, like <laughs> Texas oil uh, barons. <laughs> well, I'm luckily I'm out of the big city now and I'm in a small town and we have very few cases. So, oh, nice. Um, and all the restaurants have like these little, like even like what they, they have like these big sh- plastic sheet booth things. So you can go out, but you don't go near anybody. And you- um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I saw the news the other day. This restaurant, and it had, you, you've seen like the big three top circus tents that yes. have the sides that can come down and like tie together. Uh huh. This restaurant was like, we have outdoor seating due to COVID. And they had like a bunch of people in that thing all wrapped up. I'm like, does that kind of <laughs> defeat the purpose of going outside if, if you're just in a little germ factory with hot air blowing? <laughs> this is our tent of pestilence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We call this the, pe- the, the Petri dish. <laughs> Come on in. Um, yes. I, I don't know. I I've, I tend to be more uh, uh, scared, not scared, but cautious, like, ca- careful, cautious. Yeah, that's a lot better than... Uh, uh, some of the names I've been called by my fellow band members <laughs> for not playing games right now. <laughs> yeah, we've been very cautious, and especially because um, in our little bubble, we have some older people and people who are immune compromised. So we stick to our bubble yeah. um, and we only really do things outside uh, unless it's too cold. So our neighbors will talk to them only outside and obviously um, two meters away. And um, and we try to, what we've been trying to do is once a week, we pick a local restaurant to get takeout so that we're yeah. still supporting local restaurants and things. Um, the same but we're not idea. really... Uh, exposing herself but my mom and i have been known to get sneak out <laughs> yes <laughs> we've my mom and i have snuck out to our favorite breakfast place at like 7 30 in the morning on a saturday um and we've been the only ones really in there everyone else is getting takeout or asleep because you're um, in a small town you can kind of sneak yes. one of those in yeah and, and we're it. in the country and everything is very spread out and we have very few cases but my mom's actually a nurse so we're I just kind of go with what she says is a good idea or not a right. good idea. Should stick with the professionals. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's yeah, her specialty. I, I, that's the thing here. Like early on when I'd have some friends and family and relatives who would be like, oh, it's it's overblown. It's not that big a deal. It's just, they're just trying to scare us, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, um, okay, well, I don't believe that. But I can at least make the make the argument for them that, okay, they're not insane. They just really believe this. Well, then like especially my family and some friend circles, we've known people who've died from it. And it's like, yeah. it's not a joke. This is not, I'm bad anyway, I don't want to go on it. This is not a podcast about the <laughs> pandemic. I opened a to- can of infected worms. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but yeah, what we have been able to do during this pandemic is play some goddamn video games. <laughs> yes. A lot of them. I can, I can tell you right now, 2020 uh, has been the most video games I've played in 20 years, probably. <laughs> uh, and that's saying something, because I put in some time and wow <laughs> back in the day. I um, I know that the lockdown is affecting everyone because my parents have become very active on Twitch. Yeah, I, your dad was in my channel the other day chatting me up and just having a good old time. It wasn't like... like a lot of people, you know, I I know you're younger than me, but our your your parents are a little bit older than or are, are farther away than from you than my parents are from me. So they're they're somewhat similar in age. Yeah. And a lot of that generation to me doesn't get Twitch or they if they do come in Twitch, it's kinda like a I just want to stop in and say hi and support my my family, my my son, my daughter, whatever. Um but your dad is he's he's drinking the Kool-Aid, he's all in on Twitch. He's he's in multiple times in a week. Yes, and he has people he subscribes to. He even has YouTubers that he subscribes to on Patreon. So like just totally unrelated. Yeah, like travel. He has a bunch of travel vloggers that he likes to subscribe to. Oh, yeah, and uh, he's a big. There's a, um, I think his name is Bro XH, and he's a Maori woodworker on Twitch that he likes, and he has a his whole little his own list, and some of them are our community, and some of them aren't. So. 
So all this stuff is going to keep our parents forever young. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Well, speaking of uh, new video games, other than the title of this episode, um, what is this game called? Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk. 2077. <laughs> Yeah, I was called it Fallout. <laughs> Fallout 2077. Yes, it feels so much like a Fallout game. Do Zex Fallout 2077? <laughs> yeah, that's the. Oh my god! When we get to the talk about the episode or that about the game, I have some words on that. But have you played anything else lately? I have been playing a lot of a little Canadian indie title. Um, get that called, Canadian in there. Yes. Um, <laughs> I believe they're a North American developer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> a, a Montreal-based uh, developer, um, a little studio called Thunder Lotus, and they made a game called Spirit Fair that I just completely fell in love with. Can, I, had can it, I tell you something funny? Yes. You can ask Dee about this one day uh, when you talk to her in her chat, but we're watching some like best uh, or like games you might not have heard of or games coming out soon for the Switch. There's a list of them on this YouTube channel. I don't remember what it was. Game ranks or one of those. And that game come up. And I said, you know who would like this game? I bet this is right up Amanda's alley. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I don't want to say I told you so to my wife, but I did. You, you, you did tell her and you were correct. <laughs> um, so it's this is a game called Spirit Fair. It's a management sim sandbox platformer. That's how I would describe it. So you are, you know, you are on a boat and you, you know, build up your boat and you manage it. It's a little bit like Stardew Valley in that you have little farms and animals that you take care of. It's less in depth in terms of game mechanics, but then it's more platformer-y when you go to collect resources. There's little platform levels that you'll do um, to collect ores and materials. Uh, but the concept, the premise is that you are um, a girl named Stella and you have died and you've taken over. You are the next ferryman on the mythological river Styx, so to speak. Yes. You're and, escorting people to the other side. Yes, exactly. And you are caring for spirits, finding spirits, caring for them, trying to help them fulfill their last wishes and resolve any issues they have that are keeping them from moving on. And then when they're ready, you take them and they move on. So your um, standard Patrick Swayze ghost rules. Yeah, exactly. Wait, is, that, is that a reference anybody's going to get anymore? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen yeah. that movie? Oh, yes. Okay, yes. okay. With, yep. With Demi Moore and Whoopi Goldberg. I yes. Believe. Yeah. Very good Sorry, movie. Please allow me to or allow me to stop interrupting you. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, any kids um, are questioning what it is, there was a community episode where they do pottery, and it's referenced a lot. <laughs> that's um, that's how you would know it from what you would know it from children. Um, anyway, so yeah, you find these little spirits and you take care of them. And I thought it was going to be extremely simplistic, but it is, I'm not going to talk about it, uh, too much because obviously we're here to talk about cyberpunk and there is a lot to talk about, but Spirit Fairer is emotionally one of the most in-depth games I've played. The writing is incredible. It really took me by surprise, especially because the first couple hours, um, I kind of thought it was like a Animal Crossing Stardew type thing with a that was almost a little too cutesy. But then as you talk to the characters and learn their backstories and what they're trying to deal with and help them deal with those issues, it's extremely relatable and um it deals with a lot of it subtly deals with a lot of concepts like grief and anger and regret and things like that in a way that is not depressing. It's not, um, it doesn't hit you over the head with it. It's really pretty incredible. And, um, I ha I streamed it. Um, none of the characters are voiced. It's all only, um, written text. And so I made sure to have a different voice for every character. And, um, to my surprise, it was some of the most popular streams I've ever had. And many of the viewers said it was like listening to an audiobook, and I would relate this to reading a book, playing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh yeah, I I wholeheartedly recommend it. Um, and I can honestly say it is possibly my favorite game of 2020. That is awesome. I know you really liked it because you messaged me one night and you're like, 
we got to talk about this in the podcast. I just yeah. cried at this character development and I was like, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. I, yep. I was like, uh, I was just like, I just, you know, and, and this is not really spoilery. Um, because obviously all you, your point, the point of the, the game <laughs> is to take characters to the afterlife to say goodbye. And, um, there was a part where I had to, you know, there was a, um, a little hedgehog with dementia who I was caring for. And, um, she, you know, I'm taking her down the river to say goodbye, you know, to let her go. And she's like thinking that I'm her daughter and then having these moments of confusion. And, and it just felt so real and so touching. And the writing was so incredible that on stream, as I was trying to act, do two character voices, I was, I was struggling more than I've ever, ever struggled to, to act. And, uh, so suffice to say, I didn't do it. Yes. (laughs) So (laughs) suffice it to say, it was like not my best performance ever. Um, but it was, it was amazing and I cannot recommend it enough. So make sure you guys check that out. You, you're playing on Switch, right? I am playing it on Switch, but how it's much was a, it? Oh, it was under. I think it was under twenty dollars Canadian. Okay. I think, um, but it's also on PC. So, nice. um, and it's. I think it's on every platform. So, um, go check it out. It might be on Xbox Game Pass. I um, someone had said that to me. In uh, one of my viewers had told me that, but I have not confirmed that like maybe it went on recently Mm -hmm. so give it a look and and see but it's not an expensive game um and uh it is beautiful how many hours would you say you have in it if you had to guess oh um i think i've seen you stream it for about 12 yeah 12 or 15 hours i would say i played it yeah well that's great that's it's always great to find a game that you you, you know, when you're looking through the indie list, you see an indie game, you're like, that looks like it could be interesting. And then it surprises you by being a interesting and b surpassing your expectations of what you thought it might be. So I'm, I'm very excited that you found that, um, the game that I was playing before cyberpunk came out was a game called, Oh, what is it called with the sword? Have you seen it? With this uh, Hades? No, no, no. I, I did play a lot of Hades, but I, I'm not ready to talk about Hades yet. Okay. Uh, it's called. Um, oh shoot, where is it at? It is called Ghost Runner. Ghost Runner. I'm just going in my mind thinking of things I've seen you play recently. So <laughs> I played it for about three nights. I don't have a lot of time in it because um, I'm currently rebuilding my computer setup, and I didn't have the right HDMI cable to get. 60 frames per second in the game. So I had to cut my stream short, but um, <laughs> it's basically, it was on sale and it w- it's a new game. And it's basically a first person sword game where you run and jump on walls, sort of like Genji from overwatch. Um, I don't have a whole lot of deep story uh, information about it, but I played it for probably 10 hours in total. And I can tell you it's def If you find it on a sale, you find it cheap. enough. it's not a very expensive game. Check it out if you like, if that sounds fun. If, imagine playing a game, a story-based game where you're Genji and you can slow down time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like a, and, like a melee super hot. Exactly. Exactly. And, and super hot's a very apt comparison because you, if you die, you're right back in it. It doesn't like go back to a load screen and start you at the beginning of the level. It just goes right back to a section. So it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not going to. Not going to make you cry, I don't think, unless maybe there's a, a good story <laughs> at the end, but um, it's just a fun action game. And sometimes you just need to run and cut shit, you know? <laughs> which, which well, I've seen you into, do that a lot on Cyberpunk, actually. I was going to say, which brings us into the title episode of the episode, Cyberpunk 2077. Um, Amanda, would you like to start off and tell us what, you know, your your impressions or idea of what Cyberpunk was going to be and what made you decide to get it? Sure. So, um, it. I knew that it was going to be um, an open world RPG because I had played The Witcher. Yeah. uh, Which is also a CD Project Red. And um, I knew that it was going to be detailed and I knew that the characters would be interesting. And I had not really spoiled myself too much about the story and I had not really paid too much attention to the hype because... Um, there's always, you know, every year there's that one game 
that everybody wants, everyone's thinking about, and that everyone's been waiting a long time for. Yeah, absolutely. And I try not to build up my expectations because I know that sometimes, even if a game is amazing, um, it may not be exactly what you were expecting or exactly the, what you wanted. So I try not to do that anymore. But um, and, and if you can, sometimes it's hard yeah. to do that, especially <laughs> if it's like a, a franchise or a genre mm-hmm. or a developer that you really trust and love. The last yes. one I did that with was Sekiro. I, uh, Dark Souls guys made that game. And I was like, well, I can't wait to play this. Pre-ordered it. I've never finished it. I got about a uh, fifth of the way into it. I'm not good. Like, I don't like it. <laughs> I um I have yet to play Sekiro or Ghost of Tsushima, but in my mind, I mix the two of them up because they're both like samurais. Well, uh, Ghost of Tsushima is a kind of a casual. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's not difficult, but it'll be fun and doable. The Sekiro will make you break a controller within two hours. <laughs> promise you. I'm not a Souls player, so I'll probably go for Ghost of Tsushima. <laughs> I am a um, Souls player, and I think Sekiro's harder. <laughs> Um, in any case, so cyberpunk, I, I would, that's what I was expecting. Um, what we all expect from CD project red, which is, um, an, um, um, a detailed, immersive open world RPG with multiple, um, non linear story paths and, um, and lots of side missions to get lost in and the ability to affect the world. And that is what I, I think that they delivered on that. Um, the reason why I wanted to get the game is because um, before we all started living in one in real life, dystopian um, dystopian stories were my favorite. Books, movies, TV shows, video games. I loved a good dystopia. So um, the Fallout games, Wasteland 3 I played recently. Um, uh, any game where it's been, you know, zombie stuff, anything where it's been the end of the world and we have to survive. Last of Us, certainly a dystopia. Um, so that apocalyptic, you know, humans have, humans have messed things up and now there's a handful of them trying to make it um, a less horrible world have, has always appealed to me. And um, yeah. so cyberpunk was uh, definitely that that kind of um, theme. And then as well, um, movies like Blade Runner and Logan's Run. Which could literally take place within this game. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. uh, Blade Runner. um, I noticed uh, Blade Runner, Fifth Element. um, There's so much um, kind of 80s sci-fi baked into this game um, that I think that's I, a really good way to put it. They, yeah. they, they definitely caught the eighties version of what cyberpunk would feel like. Yes. I mean, it, it literally, I, I, I think you step out of your, your apartment and you walk up and there's a sushi shop that looks right mm-hmm. out of blade runner with the lights and the smoke and everybody in this one smokes just like they did in blade. Runner. <laughs> it also, um, if you ever watched cowboy bebop, yeah. um, it reminds me a lot of cowboy bebop as well. And these were all things that were my bread and butter in my formative years. And, um, and so, to be able to step into that world and have it be exactly as I remember from those movies and comic books and TV shows um, was incredibly appealing to me. And there's a definite, uh, there's a definite aesthetic that they caught in, a, in an era. It's like, if you ever see, like, if you go back and look at what they thought the future would look like in the fifties and everything's like tin rounded spaceship looking things, they definitely caught the eighties version of cyberpunk in this. And even having Keanu Reeves, who was, you know, obviously he's still a star, but he was a star in the late eighties, early nineties as well. Um, you could tell like this playing through, uh, I know I don't have 50 hours like Amanda does in it, but I have, <laughs> I have about 30 and it, it definitely feels like um, f- from him, a passion project. He's not just an actor. They hired off the street. Uh, I think, I think they, those guys, I don't know. I don't know the story whether he reached out to them or they reached out to him, but you could definitely tell he's not just like this. Oh, hey, there's Keanu Reeves for five minutes. He's in the story all the way through. Mm-hmm. I, I, I won't give any spoilers, but like you, I I actually was all the way. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know, I was kind of naysaying this um, this game for the middle part of this year because I thought it was just going to be too much. It was going to collapse under the weight of its own expectation and, and hype. And 
Um, and in some ways it has, I, I want to be clear when I tell the listeners here that we know, uh, man and I have talked about it off stream, but, uh, or off before we recorded this, that there are definite real issues with the, the base PS4 and Xbox one issues of this game. We haven't personally played them. We've, we've seen the memes on Twitter and we've, we've, we've heard people talking about it, but we've been playing it on pretty modern PC hardware. Um, and Amanda, you have, what kind of graphics card do you have? I've got a 1080. Yeah, so you, yeah. You, you don't even have an RTX card, and you're able to enjoy it, right? Oh, yeah. I've not had um, – I've certainly had glitches and bugs, yeah. but I haven't had any issues running the game at a stable 60, and um, and I've been streaming it as well, uh, which is often really GPU-intensive. So Yes, absolutely. Um, it, and it, I haven't had a lot of problems. Now, I have – and I've kept my settings high, but I've turned off a lot of extras like um, the depth of field and the motion blur and, and things like that. So there's, there's a couple of real key items you can turn down in the settings, like the fog mm-hmm. and some of the shadows yes. um, will really help your performance. Um, I have an RTX card and uh, you can't turn RTX on unless you want to look at this slideshow. Um and I stream with a second computer, so I don't have it affecting my FPS. But I struggle to maintain 60 with those settings. Uh, it's mm-hmm. it's a very intensive game. And I'm glad that they did it. In fact, I almost didn't buy it on day one. But it's sort of the same reason I bought Death Stranding when it was on a deep discount over uh, oh, a couple weeks ago. They had a big sale on Steam. And I bought it for like $20 because I'm like, I really just want to like see how well my computer can run it. <laughs> <laughs> and Cyberpunk, I, I bought it and um, kind of assuming like... Yeah, it's had its bugs, and I'm not a big Fallout player. I know Fallout's kind of one of those games that's famous for having bugs, but people still love it anyway. And that's kind of how I viewed Cyberpunk. I've only had two bugs where I had to literally crash, the game crashed, and I had to restart. Um, everything else has just been weird glitches or it throwing me off a cliff or something, or, you know, something mm-hmm. temporary. How about you? I've only had a few. Um a few glitches where I've had to reload saves. Okay. Um, but I uh, will say in full disclosure, I would say about once per game session. So every time I play it, I normally play it between like five and eight hours. <laughs> yeah. What time did you start streaming today? It was like early. I start streaming at 10 a.m. Eastern time every day. Okay. Um, so, and normally in the past, I do a five hour stream that I've always done five hours because at the end I get tired. Yeah. Um, we just, I don't, cyberpunk has thrown those rules out the window i go until (laughs) i'm starving to death um and uh but so i would say that my and sometimes i'll play a little bit extra in the evening as well so i would say most of my game sessions are between five and eight hours um and i would say that i've had to reload a save once a day um where i had to go back and auto save and now um those bugs that I've encountered are things where um, for some reason, say it's a um, an escort quest or something like that, the yeah. um, NPC will, you know, not move, like will not follow anymore um, or a... The um, enemies will get stuck in an elevator. <laughs> yes. And now I, a lot of those little bugs are just graphical, you know, like someone will T-pose or yeah. something like that. Um, so most of the time it's, not that um it's not game breaking um yeah i would say it's it's not unplayable i, I even if we I, I played today for probably five hours and i think i had one bug i had one where i alt tabbed out of the game and back in and then couldn't do anything mm-hmm. but that might that might have just been me you know running 18 apps you know streaming <laughs> having yeah. video playing on the second monitor <laughs> it's hard um, to tell because we're obviously not playing in a qa environment and right so it's hard for us to tell um except that most of the time we're playing other games you know you and i both play many varied types of games i don't get that problem in most games so yeah i will now, say play- in full disclosure it's an it's an issue do you play? Did you play Fallout at release or any of the Fallout games? Yes, I have. Um, if, you, if you had to say which one, which one feels like it had more bugs, or is it comparable, or is is, is Cyberpunk beat the record? Um, I would say it's comparable to like Fallout Four or Skyrim. Okay. Um, I would not compare it to say Fallout seventy six on launch, um, which you know was was literally unplayable for many people. Oh uh, yeah. Um 
I would say it's more comparable to to Fallout Three, Fallout Four, like the Bethesda games or um, Rockstar uh, games, and I think that it's symptomatic of any extremely large open world detailed game with yeah i think that's fair um so many moving parts not just in terms of what you can do but things you can pick up and break and push and pull and nbc's um everywhere and side quests just um tucked around every corner waiting for you the the, the level of de- um I wouldn't say the little, it's not necessarily the detail in terms of like the textures, but the detail in terms of, um, um, how, the how many AI objects. Has to interact, and, yeah. yeah, exactly. There's just so much to do. And, um, I would say that this does feel a bit like we're playing an unfinished game. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say that's a fair, um, criticism to I, make. I, I, I can't argue with that. And I could, yeah. I could make, but, um, I, I don't feel like it's unfinished to me. At least I'm and now granted you're farther in. Um, yeah. but I've not ran into so many like like I remember when Fallout was out, there were just quests you couldn't finish. Have you found any of those? I haven't found anything yet that was not workaroundable by just loading another yeah. save. And um so that's so that's I have a fr- oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I have a friend Dama who's literally finished the game yesterday. And he said, the, the only thing he, he, he wasn't even mad about it, but the only thing we were talking, he said, uh, there was one quest that he didn't find. He went through like this giant list that, and, and he was trying to 100% everything. And I, I said, were there any quests that you couldn't finish because the game's broken and you just have to wait for a patch? And I know that like Valhalla, he'd finished Valhalla a week ago and it had like four of them. Mm-hmm. So like, that's, that's the kind of like. Like okay, if if the if the AI gets buggy and you can't finish the game, and but you can reload the save and then it works, that's one thing. If you like literally can't complete the quest because the game wasn't coded correctly, that's another for me. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, the game could have used another delay, but I think that the um, the studio had to choose between upsetting people with a delay or upsetting people with some bugs, and. Yeah. Um, and so th- they were kind of damned if they didn't, damned if they didn't, did, well, and if they, damned if they didn't. So if they would have delayed it past Christmas, I think it would have affected their sales because yeah. it was so many delays already. And and you know, speaking of that, I'm kind of a two minds on this because they did come out and say, "Hey, we'll give you guys a refund on on base consoles uh, because we're sorry it wasn't ready." And I'm like, "Yeah, I I get why they released it, but it was still a dishonest move." And yeah. Because they knew, they knew when they released it that it was going to be, uh, it, it was going to be at least poorly received, if not riotous, like it's kind of been. <laughs> I guess that their risk management uh, decisions probably had a lot of. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it had a lot was of uh, hemming cost. and hawing, but yeah, lying about it to base console players mm-hmm. was because he literally said like two weeks ago that it was good that the base consoles. I don't remember the exact quote, but he like literally specifically they were asking him about the base PS4 and base Xbox One. He was like. It actually, I think everyone's going to be surprised with how run, how good it runs there. Uh, and, and you know, I, it was probably the least cost solution to lie to those people, but it was still a lie. And I don't think just because they came out later and said, hey, we'll give you a refund back. Everyone's like, oh, look how great CD Projekt Red is for, let, for giving refunds. I'm like, yeah. it's not it's not great that, that they did it. Uh, you know, they don't have to give you a refund, but their reputation would have taken a huge hit if they wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Yeah, it it would have been maybe nice for them to delay it just for base consoles and say, yeah. you know, um, for that, but, for just for that audience to tell them, you know, you're you want, and we know you want to play it, um, but unfortunately you have to wait because otherwise you're not going <laughs> to enjoy yourselves. So, and, and I don't want to, I, I I hate talking negative about it because, but that is a huge. If you are a base console player that we're looking forward to this game, and this game was announced for the, that generation of consoles. You have every right to be pissed. Now, yeah. excuse me while I gush about how much I love this fucking game. <laughs> <laughs> I have all good notes in front of me. I just wanted to yeah. get the negatives out of the way. Yeah. So we ate, we took our medicine early, you guys. We hear you. <laughs> if you're if you're mad at this game, you are not wrong to be mad at this game. Now, excuse us while we talk about how amazing it is. Go ahead, Amanda. Oh my god, I love it. I feel I've had so much fun 
from the main story to the side quests to bombing around on my motorcycle. I've just, the hacking, I, I cannot wait to, and then watching other people play it with different builds. I cannot wait to replay this game with different builds, with different origins. I, have not been this excited about a game in so long. And I wasn't even pumped about it until about a week before it came out. Um, and I just, it's, there's emotional moments, um, which you saw coming that I was somehow blissfully ignorant of, even this though it was in the trailers. Day, this guy's one day away from retirement. Yes, All he has to do is complete um, this one last mission. How? Who could have called what was going to happen next? I know, yeah. And and much like The Witcher 3, something that I loved about The Witcher was that I could make a simple decision with a side quest, and then yeah. it would have an impact 10 hours later. I've had moments like that in Cyberpunk. I'm not going to give those away, because right. I want you to experience them for yourself. But I've also had many moments where I've been talking to somebody about something I've done and they're in the same place in the story as me. And the converse, every single element of that mission played out completely differently for them, right down to the conversations they had with NPCs were different. And so I cannot wait to replay this game and have a completely different experience. Um, yeah, watching you really... play it, oh my okay. gosh. I I have as much fun watching you play it because I'm playing um uh rifles and handguns and um and high and like um hacking Stealth. ability. Oh hacking, yeah. Yeah, and you are going like melee with swords route and yeah. doing a lot of the engineering and crafting, and both of them look so fun. I cannot wait. I think I'm at 2,000 decapitations in the game so far. I'm keeping a, wow. keeping a counter. What I've been most impressed with is I think, like, just from my experience, I've not finished the game. I've got roughly 30 hours into it. I've done a lot of side missions, and uh, I've had some conversations with people who've played farther than, than even us, and I agree with their, their assessment. Uh, it, I'm talking about Dama. He and I t spoke about it quite a bit, and he, what he says, he, he really found in the game, and I've what I've seen already, I agree with him, is that the the main story missions are are good, okay to good, and, and even some of them are very amazing. Uh, but the side missions aren't as empty feeling as they can be in other open world games. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm looking at Ubisoft, but like I, I was doing a side mission, and this is what connected the whole city for me. You, you, you're doing a side mission, and this person's, you know, do, I, I'm not going to get any specifics, but they knew and talked about other characters and then gave us things to go back to that character with that's part of the main yeah. story. And, and that is a way to make the city and make this world feel lived in that you don't get in a lot of open world games. A lot of, I, I blame, I've talked about this a lot on this podcast before, but I blame MMOs mostly for this, that I like, after you play long enough, you kind of see through the code, like you're watching mm -hmm. the matrix. Thank you, Keanu Reeves. Um, <laughs> and, and like, okay, I know this is a separate quest line. It's not really related to anything, but there's a lot more of that like spider webbing going on in the quest lines in cyberpunk than I, than I ever expected. Yeah, it is. I've seen a lot of comparisons to GTA and G I found GTA extremely li like a very linear experience. Yes. Whereas this, um, this doesn't really feel like we're on any specific path. Certainly the main story is building and going towards um, a pretty specific goal. Mm -hmm. Um, your character, the protagonist has a very clear goal, um, and the, um, you know, two or three NPCs that they are surrounded by have some very clear goals. But besides that, um, you have no idea what the outcome of your decisions are going to be for the characters around you, for you, for the ending of the story. You have no idea where it's going to go. And I'm finding myself having moments where I'm agonizing over a decision in a side quest because I don't know how it's going to affect the rest of the story. And um, and it feels like my decisions have weight, which I haven't felt in a long time. I had been playing Valhalla before. That was the last new release I was playing before Spiritfarer. And I also felt like in Valhalla, it was... And I love Valhalla. I loved uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. But it was not 
it was a completely different feeling to this where I just, um, I, I know that my decisions are going to have an impact on my game. Yeah. And I know th- this that feels r- real and lived in where yes. I, I, it's been Assassin's Creed games to me are like, okay, here's all the open world stuff. Go find the bases, go click the, go yeah. find the highest mountain. And then, and then when you get to the end of it, the story section, it's like a push and play on the, on the, uh, on the DVD player and watching, yeah. watching a section. And then, okay, now we're going to let you back in the sandbox, go do all mm-hmm. the little missions and the chores. This is just, um, I had, um, a, there was a mission that I had that I absolutely loved very early on in the game. And, um, I watched and I, I took like probably an hour to do it and I had so much fun doing it. And then I watched you just sort of like do like two minutes of it and then <laughs> it ended. Um, and, and I know there's going to be so many of those things for me where there have been missions that I've done differently and they've ended early or, um, what have you, where I'll go and, and do it again and it will be completely different. So. Yeah, yeah. The, one of those things that uh, when Damon and I were talking about too that I found is there there are some missions that you can only find if an NPC yells at you. I was walking by and this cop said, "Hey, you," and mm-hmm. I, I you could just keep walking, or yep. you could turn around and go back up and stand in front of you, and all of a sudden, oh, a quest line opens up. I had a quest today. This is a very small. It was a two minute, five minute moment mm-hmm. in the game um, on my stream. And, um, it's not a massive spoiler or an Easter egg or anything. So I'm not going to, I'll say what it was, but I was walking and I heard a robotic voice saying, Hey there. Hello. And I turned around and it was a vending machine <laughs> talking to me. Yeah. And I had a conversation with the vending machine. Um, they gave me some free snacks. They asked me to move a, um, all they wanted was for me to move a dumpster that was blocking their view of the street because they like to watch people <laughs> like walking around, I guess. Yeah. And um and uh yeah, and I I had this little two minute conversation with the vending machine, pushed the dumpster out of the way for them, and they said, Thank you, give me a treat, and that was that. And <laughs> I have no idea if, you know, at the end of the game, the um, vending machine is going to be, it'll be like a Scooby-Doo where they pull off the mask and it was the vending machine all along. I have no idea. <laughs> and but right now you're so involved and invested in the world that <laughs> you, you, you expect it. And I think that's important because I, we all, we all play video games. If you're listening to this, I know you play video games and there's a, there's a difference between, um, you know, b- believing it, c- anything can happen and knowing that things can't happen. And when, this game, unlike most to me so far, I feel like anything can happen. I don't feel like, oh, well, there, there's no way that this NPC is going to die or there's no mm-hmm. way that this story beat's going to go a different way. And this game definitely is, is up for grabs because and, and they use the setting so well for that because this is not a massive spoiler either because I'm not going to name names, but. Because you have like your body, your character is full of cybernetics and, and computers and AI, you have there are like ghosts that you can see that are actual like AI or saved personalities. It's all part of the story. I'm not going to say any more than that. And they use that ef- super effectively to keep you invested in the world because you'll all of a sudden you'll be in an area you've been to a hundred times and they'll stop and your 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 ghost robot buddy has to talk to you about something. And, and they, they I can't say any more than that, other than it, 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 it makes the world have some depth that you don't see in these kind of games. And on top of it being a unique aesthetic, I know it's weird to think of cyberpunk being as a unique aesthetic, but really we were talking about, we joked earlier, Amanda, about Deus Ex Machina that, or Deus Ex, the game from the late nineties, one of the first PC games that really blew my mind was that was Deus Ex. And they made some more action adventure ones in the mid 2000s, the uh, Mankind Divided and whatnot, which were good yeah, games, but they didn't Those quite, are what I'm familiar with. Yeah, they didn't quite capture this. If you, it, it, I mean, if you go back and look at it now, it looks like an N64 game, but for its time, <laughs> it was like 1999, 2000. It was one of the first games. It was exactly, well, not exactly like this. It was, it was like this, but instead of it being open world, it was levels. And there were like, it was famous for having like multiple ways to go through, but your character could, 
he could have implants, he could have optics, he could have you know special guns that that work together, and you could spec your character out just like this. If you went back to 1999 and took Deus Ex and made it an open world Ubisoft game with 2020 graphics, that's what Cyberpunk is, and it's yeah. it's really really fun, and I would recommend it if you're on the fence about it and you have the hardware to run it. Um, if you I get it, but if you don't, if you're a if you're if you're holding out and you heard us, you know you know, goof on this and talk about how great it is for the last 20 minutes and you want to go get it, but you only have a uh, base PS4 or an Xbox one. I would recommend that you wait until January or February when they put out these patches they're talking about to help improve performance. Because from what I've seen videos and I'm not talking about the day one patch, I'm talking about patched up and ready. It, it just, I think you're, you owe it to yourself to wait and cause who knows, maybe there'll be a sale by, by Jan- February, March. You know what I mean? Yep. Or, you know, you might end up uh, upgrading your PC or getting the new, a newer genre. Um, yeah. So. Maybe we'll find PS5s at the end of the rainbow one day. <laughs> I say as I got a PS5. <laughs> you lucky bastard. That's the game I should have talked about what I've been playing lately. <laughs> what have but, you been playing? Hey, uh, Demon Souls. <laughs> oh, right, right. But I talk about Souls all the time on this podcast. So I try to shy away from it. <laughs> we get it. Uh, so if people want to come by and watch you play cyberpunk this week or next, where would they be able to do that? They would be able to go to twitch.tv slash real Amanda. Awesome. Uh, and you're also on Twitter. Yes, I am on Twitter and Instagram um, and TikTok. Wait, and you have a website that has all this information, don't you? I do. You can go to realamandalive.com. You can find my socials, you can find my Twitch, and you could even hire me to do voice work for you. Nice. Well, Amanda, I know we didn't get to talk about this game that you love as much as you wanted to, <laughs> uh, because that would be a four hour podcast. <laughs> But That's maybe okay. if we get the feedback, if you guys want to hear me and Amanda gush about uh, Cyberpunk 2077 for a whole other episode where it's all, all we'll do, and it'll be kind of a spoilery one where we can talk about what we like and what we don't like in detail, tweet at either her or me. I'm at Crunky TTV on Twitter. You come to either one of our uh, streams um, or just tweet at the podcast too, or at uh, GLY podcast on Twitter. And if we get enough feedback for that, we'll do it. Oh, yeah, I'm there. All right. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for being on this week's episode and we'll talk soon. Talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.